My name is George Talbot. I'm a so staff software engineer at Google, and I'm responsible for a chunk of our planet scale planet scaled monitoring infrastructure. I'll tell you a little bit about what that is. I'll give you a little bit of background. So monitoring at Google, uh, I should say, mo monitoring at Google is a global problem. We have data centers and points of presence all over the world. That, uh, they're full of computers that we use to run our services. So besides that global span, we have a huge volume. We monitor billions of things. Every job running on every computer at Google, network hardware, uh, operating systems, various infrastructure services, uh, and it's everything from bigger to smaller services. Uh, so it's hundreds of billions of values being measured at any one time, and we ingest about two and a half terabytes per second. Uh, we have a pretty strong culture of people monitoring their systems. You don't run something in production if you don't know how it works and you aren't measuring how well it's working right now. Every team's responsible for setting up their monitoring and alerting for their services. And this is constantly changing as new services happen, new ways to monitor things happen. Uh, so we have to evolve with it. So uh, one of the parts of the talk later that I enjoy a lot is some of the lessons we've learned in scaling a system like this from something that's smaller to something that covers all of Google. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the architecture and data model of our system, and I'll try to interject, here's where the streaming happens. So we have data centers all over the globe. We need to monitor things all over the globe. Where do we start? Well, we start with local monitoring. We break the world into zones, and a zone is like a strongly connected network region. Think of like a building full of computers and data centers and stuff like that. So we monitor and store locally within a zone. So we store data near where it's collected. We manage, we manage the alert and query globally, and monitoring in the zone is part of that larger system, and, but we can operate autonomously, like if a data center is disconnected from the rest of the world because you know, somebody dragged a backhoe across a fiber optic cable or something. Um, and this is monitoring as, as a service. People don't stand up their own monitoring jobs in production. We run it for you. So let's look inside one of these zones. So monarch zone, ingestion, queries, retention, evaluation, notification, etc. So let's start with ingestion. Ingestion starts with some sort of monitored entity that, that you care about. Maybe it's your jobs running on our cluster, maybe you're a network person, you care about the hardware, et cetera. Uh, everything is instrumented, we call our library StreamZ, uh, and it defines classes which define metrics, which is the unit of information that we monitor. And it has the ability to contact our system and send data about that entity to Monarch so we know about it. So metrics are the unit of information we monitor. I'll tell you a little bit about what that is. So a metric is our basic measurement of some aspect of that monitored target. So it has a static descriptor, you know, a name, a value type, classification fields. So here's an example. This is response latencies for HTTP, uh, classified by path, the string path and the response code. And the, the value is a distribution, which is a histogram plus population plus statistics, so that you can compute percentiles. And it's constructed in such a way that you can add these things together over many ser servers. So you could say, well, what is my 95th percentile HTTP response latency over these thousand machines that are serving my website? So each entity has labels that classify the, that entity, and we call that a target. So there's a mechanism to fit the labels that, the, that these jobs export that identify themselves into a fixed schema we call a target schema. So here's an example of a job running on our Borg task scheduling system. Borg is sort of the predece internal predecessor of Kubernetes. Borg identifies by user, job name, cell, which is essentially data center, and task number. So if you started up a thousand tasks for a particular job, that's the number of the individual task. This is a very common 
target schema at Google, but you can have other ones. And it gives us an ordered space of, space of names for targets. And when I say ordered, it's like, lex think lexicographical ordering of the targets where we concatenate the fields together. So, ingestion. So this is, here is where some of the streaming is. So the, the targets use this library to write to us, and that comes to an ingestion router. And that ingestion router identify, takes the na name value pairs from the, the job that identify the entity and turn it into those target schema I took the, talked about a minute ago. And then we can use that as a key to figure out where the data should land in our backends. Also, as data is streaming into us, we have situations where there's some users that have so much data that you can't actually store it all. So we can do some pre-aggregation as the data comes in um, before it gets stored. Uh, so where's the, these ingestion routers put the data that they get? They put them in what we call the leaf. And this is uh, the central job to our zone, zone monitoring. You know, leaves are the things that we're running all over the world that record our data into an in-memory database. And they're sort of the lowest level in our hierarchy. So the targets are apportioned to the leaves by lexicographical range. And the ingestion routers track these ranges to get the data in here. Uh, leaves send their leaves write their data to recovery logs, um, which I'll talk a about a little bit more later. Which which are actually the ground truth of what's in this monitoring system. Um, so the the targets send individual metric values. The leaf retains streams of these values. So a stream looks like this. A stream has an identifier and a history. So the identifier is essentially the concatenated labels from the target that identify what the thing you're monitoring and the metric, which is the measurement. And then the history is timestamp value, timestamp value from youngest to oldest. Um, and it comes from the sequence of values for that target and that measurement sent to the leaf. So from a query perspective, these streams are gathered together into tables for each target schema and metric pair. This gives a specific structure. We have columns from the targets, columns from the metric fields, and then a column for the actual time series data. And it looks like a relational table. And it's, this is physically distributed across all the zones and leaves and everywhere. But logically, from the point of view of someone querying our system, they just see this table. So I'll talk a little bit about retention. So I was talking about recovery logs and whatnot before. So these leaves are writing to recovery logs, which are used to, like if a leaf crashes, it has to be able to read its state and, and run again. There's also, because we're divvying up our range lexicographically, lexicographically and not by like a hash or something like that, we have to have constant load balancing because you might have one part of the key range get hot or whatever. And that's this assigner task. Um, and that uses the recovery logs to move ranges around in a seamless manner because you can say, okay, you're recording this measurement, you start recording it too, read the history, history's read, okay, you stop recording it. Now we've moved the load from one thing to another. It also gives a, a path to a hist our historical repository where you can save data in a long, longer period of time, which is a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. So queries happen within a local zone. Queries come into a job call called a zone mixer. We'll talk in a little bit more detail about queries a little later. So the zone mixer will select leaves based on where it thinks the data is. It sends the queries to them. The leaves will combine data from their in-memory uh, database and whatever might be in that historical repository that's relevant. And they do their part. And they send the data back to the mixer. The mixer does its part. And it sends the result back to the originator. And this is done in a streaming fashion as well. You know, you can do queries that, you can, that are much larger than any node can fit in memory. And the data streams through with some clever buffering at each node. <coughs> Pardon me. So here's the part where we wake people up in the night. So we have an evaluator that's running standing queries, which are sort of like materialized views that um, 
that people set up to, like let's say you're doing an aggregation and a percentile to say, well, if my latency goes over you know, 250 milliseconds, make my pager go off because something's broken. That's what this evaluator job does, and it sends queries to the zone, writes the data back into the zone, and then can look at alerting thresholds and decide, oh, well, time to wake them up. So that's a monarch zone. It's a self-contained monitoring system in a zone, but we have a worldwide monitoring problem. Well, how does that work? So the zones are integrated into a single system by Global Monarch, which is logically centralized. You know, it's the place a user interacts with our system, but it is itself physically distributed. This provides a global view of what's going on in zones and has the machinery for each user to configure what Monarch's gonna do for that user. So first, configuration. Configuration resides in a distributed spanner database, like if you read about our Cloud Spanner product, same thing, uh, with lots of read replication. And the configuration is whatever the user wants to collect, how long do they want to retain it for, what are their metrics, what are their target schemas, what queries are they doing to drive their alerts and their, and their dashboards and the actual contents of dashboards, et cetera. Uh, for queries, root mixers have the same relation to zones that the zone mixers have to leaves. So query will, your query will come into the root mixer and that will say, well, I think that data is in these geographic zones, fan the query out to those zones, then it goes through the zone process, comes back, and then it comes back to you. And this is logically centralized, but it's physically distributed. So we're running root mixers all over the world. And we can do evaluation at the global level as well. If, for example, you want to say, well, did my, the global QPS for my service go way down? Wake me up. So scaling horizontally is the key point for our system. We have this unified global system where we collect, retain, query. It's distributed and robust. But as we get bigger, we don't make one thing bigger. We make new zones. So let's look at queries for a minute. So that we have this is we have actually have multiple query notations. This is a Python-based query notation, and it's uh, this is a basic example. Select the fetch select streams which which, which we want to operate upon. So here we're looking at Gmail's uh, successful response response latency for successful requests, and. Uh, the, here's more streaming. We, this is a pipe-based notation, you, so you can mentally think of the data streams out of the fetch, streams through a window operation that aligns the data in time, right? So this is, this is saying, well, show me the delta over five minutes. You know, how much, you know, how much did my, my response latency change over five minutes? And then group by, stream that into group by, which is doing aggregation, stream that into a percentile, which takes the aggregated distribution, the aggregated histogram, and figures out where 95th percentile is. This is a basic example. The query notation can do lot, a lot more joins, top streams, map stream ID, unions, general expressions. There's a lot of aggregation functions as well. So queries proceed from the global to local back to global. And at each step, mixers decide what part of the query they will execute and what parts they delegate. And the thing that's kind of interesting about our system is that the, the whole query comes into the root. The root figures out where it's going to fan it out to. But it doesn't send the whole query down. It sends what part of the query it thinks is relevant to that zone will get sent to it. And then the zone mixers do the same thing, where they're kind of cutting down the query to say, here's what goes to individual leaves. And uh, where these things go geographically is determined by physical locations in the data. And those target schema will say, oh, well, this is cell A, B, and that's in zone, I don't know, Iowa or something. Right? So the query proceeds at the zone level, aggregation, and we figure out from that query before that because we're aggregating by cell, it has to happen at the zone level. So we'll compute the aggregation and the percentile there. And that gets sent down to the leaves, and the leaves will do the fetch, will do some the, the window, some of the aggregation work, return intermediate results, and then the results propagate back up. 
um, and they're finalized at the zone level and passed to the global level. And the other thing that's interesting here in the streaming sense is as things are passed between these, these levels, you know, this is a big distributed computation with data flowing through it. So the key to getting this working right is to have really good in-memory quota management at each node so that, uh, so that like you can't have one query that denial of service is everybody. So we have a global monitoring system. How do we use it? I'll tell you that a little bit. So this is one of our internal front ends called Panopticon. Um, so it's used to con by engineers to configure our system and serve graphs and consoles. Um, oh yeah, shoot. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious from previous slide when you talked about, so it's really cool that you guys measure uh, percent, percentiles and latency. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, um, I'll just leave it here. To keep that true, like, do you have to really, so first of all, do you, like, propagate each raw metric all the way up to um, the root, or do you have to kind of, like, bucket these? Like, yes, you would have an explosion of metrics, right? Like, I know, like, I, I'm thinking from my experience in stats D world and, right. like, regular things, you just average things or... Like, well, in general, we tend to st store as much of the raw data as we can at those leaf nodes. During the query, you're aggregating together based on what your query wants, you know, based on, um, does that make sense? Uh, so like a 95th percentile um, query for that, does that? Oh, you're, oh, you're talking about like the distribute, the histogram stuff specifically? Yeah. Uh, it's bucketed histograms and the user picks the resolution. Okay. So, you know, and then we we'll, yeah, and then the percentile will be an interpolation. Uh, so, does that make sense? And we're working on uh, more sophisticated ways of uh, automatically picking those buckets. But so, but then you want things go into a bucket and you just store per bucket, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sure thing. Um, so, going back to this, this, I'll just tell you a little bit about one of the front ends. Um, users can configure what they what targets they want to retain data for for how long. Uh, for in memory, for on disk, whether there's downsampling, that sort of thing. We have a GUI that walks you through building queries, which in some ways I prefer to writing actual query notation because you see all the different parameters. Um, you can define alerts so you can be woken up at night. And you could set up consoles with collections of graphs, common controls, navigation, that sort of thing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it as a platform. You know, we don't want to just say, oh, here's Monarch, everybody, you figure it out, right? So we try to make it a little easier for our users and to simplify the learning curve. Um, so we have a custom console service that people can build their, their own consoles. We have configuration libraries that encode our best practices. So you don't have to figure out, oh, how do I build a job flapping alert? How do I build an alert that, that, that respects drains when parts of the infrastructure are powered down for maintenance or something like that? Uh, we have automatic and cross-company monitoring. So you do, for th base, basic things like job flapping or RPC latency or counts or error counts, you don't actually have to set up every, anything. We actually monitor that all that for you across the whole company. Um, and it helps you set up SLAs and SLOs. And, help, and we have automated monitoring for rollouts, which happen all the time. So we're also the back end for the cloud product. Um, and we monitor all the cloud customers and the services that, that those customers use. And there was a lot of in, in development that went into this, like encryption at rest. And we carefully controlled and audited access to the data because, you know, customer data. And we have di slightly different ways of naming things and data model uh, with some powerful query extensions that help define uh, groups that can change at runtime and stuff like that. So that's, uh, this is my favorite part, is some of the lessons that I learned when we were building the system. I've been on this project for a while, and building systems that, this, that grow to this scale can be kind of interesting. So I've learned basically three basic lessons building this system. First, good hygiene, like concurrency and stuff. Um, Scaling horizontally is the only way, practical way to scale a system like this, and it's really challenging. 
And then for large users with high cardinality, you often have to reduce their dimensions as the data comes in. They kind of, you often can't afford to store all their raw data. Like if you think of like, I don't know, every user on, every, bytes for every user on every disk at Google is an insanely large number. So let me talk about some of these lessons learned. So the first lessons lear lesson learned is good hygiene. Um, so this is really about how you develop your individual components. For us, it's properly concurrent data structures. Um, so we had a situation where a couple years ago, each of these backends, and there's those leaf backends to give you an idea of scale. For the part of our system that monitors Google, not cloud, I can't really give you numbers for cloud. The part of the system that monitors Google, there's 120,000 of those leaf processes, right? And a couple years ago, each of those processes was getting about 200 queries per second, because you know, we're fanning queries out to different things based on the data. Uh, we jumped from 200 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 5,000 queries per second in the space of six months. And boy, did we find out that we had some concurrency bottlenecks to fix. You know, we had uh, locks protecting important data structures and that sort of thing. Um, so that was interesting. So you have to care about concurrency and in individual backends because it affects the system properties as a whole. You don't want, don't want to have long tails. Um, you don't want to let components languish too long. Uh, you can have a component that seems like it's working fine, working fine, working fine, and then the system goes to hell because you weren't paying attention that that thing was getting close to a, scaling, a critical scaling limit. That happened uh, like not this summer, but last summer with one of our, that assigner thing. And it, we had an outage where it took 12 hours in a couple zones for that assigner to come back, uh, which made us reassess and redesign it. And we, in the, one of the late, latest outages where, that made the news, when networking came back, we, at, because of our redesign, we came back within 20 minutes, which was good. Um, we have to deprecate old APIs because they get in the way of scaling. We moved from pull to push collection and saved uh, you know, a fiscal equivalent of a dozen engineers worth of RAM, a uh, dozen engineers' salaries worth of RAM, and removed a, an outage prone component. So that was interesting. That took years because it touched every binary at Google. And then outliers, any of these large systems that care about performance for users, like how many nines they can deliver to users, you have to look at outliers. Like we had a recent case where there were back end, we, we test in our test cell, crashing all the back ends and bringing them back, because sometimes a user can send a query of death. Uh, and what happens when they come back. And we noticed there were like out of several thousand of these leaf processes, there were like maybe a dozen who had elevated CPU for a while. And we've looked at that and we figured out what that was and fixed it. And it turned out that we gained another nine in reliability of certain things like that uh, pre-aggregation, oddly enough. So you have to care about that or you won't be reliable. So this is a big lesson for us. Scaling horizontally, it's really hard but it's the only way to scale a system like this. So for us, it's increasing the number of leaves and the number of zones. And we have to watch for centralized services that become bottlenecks like that assigner thing. Uh, we have to look, worry about non-constant per backend costs. You know, as the system grows, what you wanna do is you wanna start up new backends and every data structure inside each backend should be about the same size. You should just have more of them. That's not always easy to guarantee, especially for configuration. It can be hard to figure out what configuration, like, like what the, what the, the thing that tells the, each of these things what data has to retain has to be pared down to match the data. Yeah, I'll, I got that. Um, oh, trip me up for a second. Um, and query costs should fan out in a constant manner as well. And we have a Bloom Feltrish indexing service that helps us do that. Um, finally, reducing dimensions early can be important. For large users, we aggregate data as it arrives for large users. And it's interesting because configuration and data multiplexing 
during that reduction is more expensive than the aggregation itself, like figuring out what data and where it should go is more important. And we can also, we also want to be able to see through aggregations and that's as a user thing. Um, and th to give you an idea of scale of this, out of that two and a half terabytes per second, about 1.8 terabytes of that is actually aggregated on the fly as it comes in. Um, so this is part of that aggregation. So here's, here's aggregating over several thousand test jobs and we can see the latency started to blow out. Um, and we're showing this as a heat map. So we can propagate traces through, like if people have used distributed tracing or do some sampling and figure out when we aggregate things, well, what were the, what were the labels when we were aggregating? So we've clicked on one part of that latency, latency hump there, and it's highlighted that most of that's from one server. Um, so when, you're, when we're doing that pre-aggregation, we have to keep track of things so that we can show the user that, oh, out of those thousands of things that we sum together to get this graph, here's the one thing that was causing you a problem. So anywho, that's the lessons we learned scaling our system. And this is a sampling that kind of I enjoy. Um, and that's about it. Thank you, I think I have some time for questions. Um, who named your app Panopticon? That's a hell of a reference. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's from an earlier, more innocent time. <laughs> you know. Gotcha. As far as I'm aware, this is the successor to uh, Borgmon, which yes. inspired Prometheus. Can you yes. talk more about the trade-offs or why you create an entirely new system for monitoring? As opposed yes. To so the, a, a few reasons. One of them is that we wanted more uniformity in how we monitor our systems at Google. You know, they're, they're large SRE teams that really know what, what they're doing, right? And we want their knowledge to be sort of leveraged across everybody else's. So that's the first thing, and that's probably the most important. The second one is it's costly and error prone to have every team standing up their own monitoring jobs. And costly meaning it's a lot of work for the SRE teams, and it's a lot of it's more machine resources than Monarch is. We we can we can amortize over economies of scale when we do that. So th that was a big thing. We have better data model than that did. Like uh, those histograms are first class data type in our system. So let me go back here. So you see you see this. People are so used to looking at percentile lines that get spit out by things but it's actually not the right model because like in this case, there was one job that created that latency hump, right? And you can go and say, oh, it's that one job, kill it, and you know, maybe the load will get redistributed and you'll bring up another one. But if, all the, but if the whole histogram moved up, that's telling you a different thing about your system and it might be that one of your dependencies got a lot worse and all your jobs are doing worse, right? So having things like like uh, the exemplars that drive this uh, picking out your one job that was bad or seeing the heat maps directly and being able to compute over that uh, has been crucial to sort of leveling up how people view their systems. And especially with these like layered systems where you might have the disks, then a disk server, then a distributed file system, and then a distributed database and all that. Each one has their own little latency hump, right? And sometimes when you look at these graphs, you can see, oh, here's the hump where, where there's a RAM cache in the drive. And here's the hump where there's a RAM cache in the disk server, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of see the different ways that these things assemble up. So it, the, that was the other thing, is that we wanted to sort of upgrade people's notions of what they could do with monitoring. And frankly, Borgmon didn't have the data model with uh, you know, the columnar data model, and that made a real big difference too. Uh, sorry if that was long, but that's, you know. Uh, thank you. Uh, to follow up on that actually, you mentioned all of these layers. Yeah. Uh, did you, two question there, uh, did you mean that um, you're monitoring as part of the job performance an actual 
uh, let's say, behavior of a disk. Um, or, and the second part is like, if part of the job happens in like a um, storage layer and part of it happens in like another layer, yeah. you basically enforce, like, I'm just kind of curious, how do you correlate it to a single, um, how do you enforce correlating that all to a single flow? Of well, the thing that I found interesting, I, you know, it's funny, I was the one that added the, the heat map display to our tool, right? And the thing that we've, we found interesting, when we look directly at the data, you could look at just the latency sum at the top level of the system and often see the band, bands in it. That just naturally fell out of the data. And then we're like, well, what's that? And then you get a, an engineer who knows the storage stack and he'll say, well, that latency hump is from this part of the system, and that one's from that part of the system. You know what I mean? It's like you, you have sort of emergent properties that come out of your data. So that was, that was actually fascinating to me, who I, especially when I started doing this, I wasn't as experienced with these large distributed layered systems. So you see them naturally kind of aligned. Like, oh, it's yeah. happening at the same time. There's a hump in this memory. Profile, yeah. And a hump in the application. So yeah. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay the leaf and uh, yeah. you say it was an in-memory database how much data do you hold per leaf or I'm, I'm not sure how that works can you uh, talk more about that I'm trying to figure out what I can actually tell you ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right um, but it's many petabytes of RAM for holding that data and that's that's the in-memory view see we, we, we immediate monitoring is in memory because a monitoring system like this is low dependency and you know, we don't depend on a lot of other services because we have to operate when literally things are on fire <laughs> right uh, so when the, like when that evaluator is doing queries for alerts that's only hitting the in memory data because we don't want to rely on that that a distributed file system exists right now or that the database on top of that exists right now there might be things that don't exist right now cuz you know things have gone crazy but we still want to get that alert out to that person you know and even when the data center is disconnected we want to get that alert out so there's things like cellular modems in our data centers and stuff to get those alerts out just in case hey so given the way you're describing the scale of this can you use monarch to monitor itself we do we run a separate copy of monarch to monitor monarch <laughs> you know you kind of have to Sweet. Um, so something that occurred to me, right, is like I'm watching your talk and it looks like you start with like proper metrics, right, like a number, and then you like aggregate them early and often, which, yeah. you know, okay, scaling, right? But like, you know, you know I, um, I've also been listening to people talking about like observability and they're talking about like these like big, like rich, like events that like get yes. emitted, right? And, <clears throat> um, and so I guess like what I'm wondering is like, okay, let's say you s you're, you're looking at this like flame graph and you see something and you want to like drill down somehow, like your system wouldn't be able to support like the proper like, or proper is the wrong word, but like it wouldn't support like honeycomb style like observability. So like, do you have well, like a separate it, system for that? Do you just like, like. Well, I, in some ways it kind of does actually, because we, bl we bl we're monitoring, logging and tracing are pretty closely welded together. So, like in a graph like this, you see, see this? Yeah. That's a trace. And if I click on that trace, the, the monitoring gives contextualization to the trace, right. right? So, here's a trace where things were probably okay, things were probably okay here, things were okay here. Oh, things were not okay here. Let me click on that and drill down to what I care about. It will drill you down to the trace. It will also drill you down to, because we've retained labels through our aggregations for this, it will t and we have the precise time instant because we took an example here, we can drill you down to the right coordinate in the logs too. So you do get, you do get sort of that log n observability that a trace will give you through a system without having to look at all the graphs of everything. It's not as nice as honey, what Honeycomb's doing with their UIs and everything. Don't get me wrong, but I we. I actually use Honeycomb. I just followed your on Twitter. Oh, no worries. <laughs>